quasi here. All throughout history, a specific number keeps appearing in pivotal moments. Almost like it's trying to tell us something. Ancient religions idolize it, science still can't explain it, and secret societies are obsessed with it. That number is 33. And in today's video, I'll be addressing the significance of this very number. There's one question that I want to answer. Is there a deeper meaning behind all of this? And more importantly, if there is, can you benefit from this hidden knowledge? But first, I wanted to show you a few strange places where this number actually appears. Did you know that the highest rank of Freemason is known as the 33rd degree Freemason? Or that for Christians, it's associated with a pivotal moment of the life of Jesus Christ as he was crucified at the age of 33, making it a number charged with immense spiritual significance the name Elohim, which means gods in Hebrew, is mentioned 33 times in the story of creation. And it's not just spiritually significant either, but physically too. Think about this. The human spine contains 33 vertebrae. The number of turns in a sequence of human DNA equals 33. Surely this couldn't be a coincidence, right? After doing some investigating, it's said that societies like the 33rd degree Masons and Rosicrucians are responsible for preserving the secret knowledge and insights into the human condition and the universe itself. Of course, no exploration of Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism is complete without addressing the theories that have been around for centuries. Some claim that the 33rd degree Masons control world events from the shadows, while others argue that they hold the keys to unlocking hidden powers within the human mind. But I've discovered that there's one person who has the answers to all of this. Do you want to know his name? Manly Palmer Hall, responsible for infiltrating both of these secret societies. He was a uh, 33rd degree Mason, as well as a Rosicrucian fellow. In today's video, I'll be looking into what he was able to uncover. But more importantly, I'll be uncovering how you too can tap into the power of the mind and how it can be leveraged in your own life to get the results that you desire. So with that, let's get started. The book that Manly Hall wrote that was so sought after is this book. It's called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And the teachings in here are very profound, so I can see why it's so sought after. But what we've got to know is that there's three main principles from this book that I've seen every single successful person that I've ever studied who was a very powerful creator of their reality, who knew how to bend reality along with their intentions, with their mind, they followed these three principles. The first of which is the law of cause and effect. Okay, and basically the quote that Manly Hall says in the book, it's in chapter three, The Human Body and Symbolism. He says, the immutability of the law was stressed that every thought and act must react according to the nature of the energy liberated thereby. This reaction was symbolized by the circle, the symbol of infinite action. So I want you to take a moment to reflect on some key parts here. He talks about the immutability of the law, but then he also mentions the concept of infinite action and the circle. And this goes to suggest that everything that we're seeing in life is cyclical, okay? It follows a cycle in with respect to time. So society follows a cyclical fashion. Um, civilizations and empires rise and then they fall. You know, just with currencies, and you're probably seeing this with the with the U.S. dollar. You know, it, it rose for a while, became the world, world's reserve currency. Now it's going through this debt ceiling, this period, and all this uncertainty is arising. And this happened in the past with. The, the German mark during the World War, um, with every single ancient civilization. Now they're thinking that, you know, civilization wasn't linear, but advanced civilizations existed 12,000 years ago. They're starting to find out that the pyramids were actually built 14, 15,000 years ago because of the erosion marks that they're seeing. And the erosion marks that they're seeing in the pyramids are actually arising. They, they arose from water. And that kind of water could have only have been produced by a great flood, which is now known as the Younger Dryers, right? So all of these things, the, you know, civilization is cyclical. Life is cyclical. We were born, then we die. You know, we follow a cycle of life. So it's not linear. Everything is cyclical. And the other concept 
is that of infinite action. We're always in a process of acting. Okay, so what I believe he means by this is energy is transferred from one form to the other. Okay, there is infinite action. One of the biggest misconceptions people have is they think physical action is different from mental action. They think mindset and action are different. You're either taking massive action or you're sitting at home and meditating in order to get a particular result and manifest a lottery win. That's completely false. If you really want to create an outcome in your life, there needs to be action. There needs to be both mental, spiritual, physical action. This is all action. Action is just movement. So this infinite action is infinite because it's moving cyclically. It never stops. There is a continual momentum, a vibration of particles and energy. Okay. Now how this relates to cause and effect is an understanding that none of this really is luck. Everything that's happening in our lives, there is a clear law of cause and effect that's going on. Okay. Something is causing something else. We only call it luck because we're not able to explain the hidden sources from which they arise. This is the immutability of the law. Now, another interesting thing that I've noticed about all of these successful people that you look at through history um, is they really understand the law of cause and effect. What do I mean by that? Their reasoning process is not by analogy. So how most people reason, how most people compare things, how most people come to their conclusions is they look at someone else, they look at what's happening right now and they compare. They say, oh, this is happening like this. That person said this, therefore this must be true. I'm reading this in the news, therefore this must be true. This leads to fear, uncertainty and doubt. And so people reason and hypothesize via analogy. They compare and contrast. That's what sheep do. <laughs> they look at something else, they look at when to panic and they look at when to ask for permission to do something. They don't think for themselves. So the real way to use this law of cause and effect is what I've seen every single wealthy person do, every single successful person do, is they reason via first principles. What does that mean? They break every single argument down to its fundamental truth. You can even look this up. I've made tons of videos on this too. They break down every single argument to what is the fundamental accepted truth at the moment. So if you hear something, it's not necessarily true. Why would someone say that? You're basically asking why until you get the root source of why this is happening. So when you learn to reason via first principles, you immediately become a creator of your reality. Becoming a creator of your reality and learning to create reality, the most fundamental quality that's required is you being authentic, you being unique, you not following someone else's path. The moment you start to compare with someone and contrast with someone, you say, oh, this person's running ads and this person's doing YouTube, therefore I should do it, therefore I should do that. No, what's your own unique path? Can you reason via first principles why one method would work and why one wouldn't? When was the last time you just took some time to sit down and think about why things are the way they are? You haven't, right? So a lot of people don't do that. They don't sit down and really think about why things are the way they are. The key thing is you have to understand this first law. You have to understand what the real cause, what are the hidden causes that's causing, you know, all the effects that we're seeing. Everything that you see manifested in physical reality is but an effect, okay? It's an effect of something. This leads very, very well into the second law, okay? The law of spirit. And I'm going to explain to you exactly what that means. So the second law, that is absolutely crucial to understand if you want to be a creator of your reality is the law of spirit that he talks about in the book. And the quote goes like this. This is in chapter 12 called Pythagorean Mathematics. And this is what he says. The universe is made up of successive gradations of good. These gradations ascending from matter, which is the least degree of good, to spirit, which is the greatest degree of good. In man, the three spheres of his threefold nature merge into a single unit, making him a single living soul. So the importance of this quote is as follows. I believe this comes from hermetic teachings where Hermes Trismegistus, known as the greatest God of all time, who existed 5,000 years before common era, I believe. And in it, the Emerald Tablet, he talks about the three different planes of existence where he talks about the least and the, the, the most gross form of existence is the physical dimension, 
A level above that is the mental dimension. And the third level above that is the spiritual dimension. Hermes was known as Hermes Tresmegistus. And Tresmegistus translates to thrice greatest, meaning he's mastered all these three planes of existence. So in this, Manly Hall says how the least degree of good is matter and the greatest degree of good is spirit. So I want you to take a moment to think about why he would say something like that. Why would he say something like that? This is why. The ancient yogis believe something like this too. They believe that what's the most grossest form, which is matter, is influenced by the most subtle form, which is nothingness. And everything evolved out of nothingness. So this is what they believed. They believed that the universe, this world as we perceive it right now, it evolved from nothingness. This nothingness became energy. This energy evolved into awareness. Awareness then evolved into consciousness. It started to become aware of itself, consciousness. It became conscious of itself. This consciousness, there started to become movements within consciousness. And this movement within consciousness is called mind. It's called thought. And this mind then created the body. So if you look at placebo effects right now, your body literally has the ability to cure cancer, right? It has the ability to cure all sorts of ailments that you would have never imagined without any outside intervention. This is, this is the technology. There's quantum computers that can't replicate the functions of, of human bodies yet. That's how sophisticated this system is. So the mind is the doing of all of this. So in order to influence the body, we have to tap into the subtler dimensions of life. And this is exactly what he means by this quote. And this, again, interestingly, goes back to this law of cause and effect, right? There is a subtle cause that is leading to all of these gross effects. If you want to create anything in your life, stop focusing on the gross matter, on the thing, on trying to manipulate and change something. Focus on the subtle source that's actually causing this effect that you're seeing. What is causing the effect that you're seeing right now? The subtle inevitably leads to the gross. So in order to make any physical change happen in your life, you have to look at the subtle source from which it originates. And this is where it all originates in the mind. Okay, so this actually leads very interestingly to the third law, the law of imagination. So let's get right to that. So last but not least, one of the most powerful laws that's completely transformed my life and over a thousand clients that we've worked with, the law of imagination. And it's very interesting to see that Manly Hall goes really deep into it and describes it beautifully. He says, imagination is the star in man, the celestial or super celestial body. This is the great secret of the mysteries. Imagination is the divine body in every man, the divine principle or idea by which each creature is begotten. And this is in chapter 25, that Pythagorean theory of music and color. Now, I want you to take a moment to reflect on this. Why does he call this the star in man? Why does he call this the celestial or super celestial body? I believe this is the subtle as the most subtle will get. Okay. And imagination is the power that runs everything. Einstein prized imagination. He said imagination is the only thing that truly governs this world. And I believe that's why you know, he describes it as the celestial or super celestial body. You know, the highest of them all, the, the greatest star that could ever exist. The, another man who always talks about imagination is uh, a person by the name of Neville Goddard. He was a 19th century um, philosopher. And Neville Goddard mentions imagination and awareness to be the most powerful of them all. And remember in principle number two, I talked about the, the concept of awareness and how you know, the yogis believed that, that that's how it evolved from, from nothingness to energy to awareness to consciousness, mind, and body. So awareness in conjunction with imagination has the power to completely rule your life, okay? So the only form of visualization though that does become very, very powerful is, uh, or imagination rather, is creative visualization. Now, there's a reason why they talk about imagination, because imagination has connotations of creativity. Creativity connotes the heart. If you simply picture something in your mind's eye, it has no effect. You're simply picturing, okay? 
there's a difference between imagining and picturing. So Neville Goddard always talks about visualizing, thinking feelingly, okay? Think feelingly. So when you visualize creatively anything that you want in your life and you project it in your mind's eye, then you're automatically invoking two of the most necessary components of manifestation and reality creation. And this is involving the heart and the mind. And everything that you do, both your heart and mind, if they're in a single congruent line, you know, let's say you want a job and you really feel good about getting that job and it makes you feel great, then you will, the, the probability that you will get that job is a lot higher. If you want to grow your business revenue, if you think about it and you feel the associated feelings of what it would be like to get that job and you live from the end, the probability that you will get it is a lot higher because now you're manipulating the subtler dimensions of energy, which is what I believe every single successful person, every single one of these Freemasons that you've seen, that's what they do so effectively, okay? So if you practice creative visualization for the next 30 days, you will begin to see changes happen in your reality like never before. And what Neville Goddard talks about is practicing creative visualization as you fall asleep before bed every single night. This also invokes your subconscious mind to completely absorb it, okay? So your conscious and the subconscious mind, again, the mind and the heart, when they work in conjunction with each other, only then do you unlock the power of reality creation, okay? So this is what I want you to do. For the next 30 days, pick one goal that you want to create in your life, that you want to accomplish. And, you know, it could be something really big, or it could be something really small, don't judge it. Don't make it too unrealistic, obviously, but lean over the edge without falling off. What does that mean? Make it large and somewhat believable, but also somewhat uncomfortable outside of your comfort zone. The thing that you want that will set your heart free, okay? So that you feel completely resonant with it. Pick that goal and visualize different instances of that goal being achieved. What does your life look like after that goal has been achieved? And do that as you fall asleep every single night. So I want you to commit to that and do that. And once you do, I hope you'll begin to see changes, but that's something that I've done for over a year. I visualized like having $100,000 in my bank account every single night. I followed Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich formula, and it didn't happen the first year, it didn't happen the second year, but by the third year, a lot of it started to happen. So I know this is the power to change your life if, if practiced over a prolonged period of time. But really, the principle I want you to take away from this is creative visualization involving both your heart and your mind, thinking, feeling. The first step to be taken is to gain control of the will. And this was said by Max Heindel, who is the uh, founder of the Rosicrucian Fellowship in the Rosicrucian Mysteries. There's some important parts to this quote. And fundamentally, what this quote really is trying to say is that wishful thinking will do nothing. Okay, so the important part to this quote is when he says, the first step to be taken is to gain control of the will. So I want you to understand a fundamental difference here. Indirectly, he talks about wishful thinking, which is when we desire something. How many times in your life have you thought about a goal and you thought, oh, that would be nice. It would be nice to have financial freedom. It would be nice to have that kind of partner, but oh, it's not for me. Oh, I've tried it. Oh, it's only for the select few who have the resources, talent, knowledge, and you've started to doubt yourself and your own ability, right? You felt this inner contraction. And this is where desire comes in. So if you want to, to create your reality, if you want to be a very, very powerful creator of your reality, you have to understand the fundamental difference between desire and intention, but also in particular, the two different types of intention that we're going to get into later. Let's begin with understanding desire. Desire can be described as wishful thinking. And this pretty much does nothing. If you just sit there and daydream, you think about, oh, if I got that, that would be great. But anyway, back to my herb derb daily life, right? I remember as a kid, I would daydream and, and think about all of the, these things as though it would be nice. Now, don't get me wrong. It's important to have desire because without desire, life wouldn't function. So wishful thinking is good, but it's ineffective if it just ends at wishful thinking. Something else needs to happen. And this is where intention comes in. The next part of this is when 
desire becomes intention. This wishful thinking becomes willful thinking. The first step to be taken is to gain control of the will. So when we become willful thinkers, when we say that would be nice, but then we ground it with, I'm going to have that. I want that. But then a level above I want that is, I will have that. I don't care how, I don't care what I have to do, I will have it. And this is when you tap into pure intention. So to very, very closely demonstrate what intention looks like, it's kind of like when you stop thinking and wishing, it's when you just act, when it's pure action, there's no thinkingness involved. So an action like that would be raising your hand, going to the mailbox and grabbing your mail, going to the shop and getting a sandwich. You have a desire. A desire arises for you to raise your hand or to itch your back or to go and get your mail. Instead of thinking about it before you do it, which is where procrastination arises, right? You simply fully transmute that desire into action. Now, there is physical action and mental action. Most people are stuck in the realm of physical action. Being stuck in this realm of physical action is actually very ineffective because action is what? It's an effect. Physical action is an effect of mental action. Something is causing physical action. When I think the right thoughts, it becomes easier for me to take the right actions. Otherwise, I'm going to be fighting against myself. If my thoughts aren't correct, there is no question of acting. If you're demotivated and you're forcing yourself to do something, you're always gonna be fighting against an invisible force, are you not? We need to get this in internal world right before we take correct action. So this is where intention comes in. Let's understand what intention really means. So going back to those different rungs, the last rung is I don't care how it happens, I will have it. The purest form of intention is the resolve to have and a level below that is the resolve to act. If we were to define intention, we would say that intention is closely defined as the resoluteness in my decision to have and to act. It's that simple. The key word here is the resoluteness and a decision. Have you noticed how any time a massive change has happened in your life, it came from a place of pure decision. You simply made a decision and you had no other choice. That's why a lot of people talk about burning the bridges. They say you must burn the bridges in order to be able to get to what you want. If you give yourself a way out, you're gonna take it. And to a certain extent, that's true. If you have too many choices, you're gonna get overwhelmed. If becoming successful is the only choice you have, there is no other way. If you have no distractions in your environment, what are you supposed to do? Get to work and do the things that you need to do, right? But the problem right now a lot of people are going through is they have too many choices, there's too many options, and they don't know what to choose. So have you noticed how in your life when you've made a change, it came from a place of there is just no other way. I cannot be here, I cannot be stuck like this. If you've gone through some form of addiction, if you've gone through some form of compulsive thinking about something or worrying about something, and you said to yourself, from this moment onwards, no more. If you've been stuck at a nine to five, kind of like I have, and when I looked at it and I looked at the next 40 years of my life and what it could look like if I was stuck in the same job, Within me, the decision was, it cannot be like this. No way, I will not tolerate this. Then the question arises, what instead? So from that place, I can make a resolute decision. So to begin any sort of the initiation of going from desire to intention is that resolve. The thing that gets you from desire to in intention is a resolve in your decision. Most people, unfortunately, get to this place from a deep pain. I'm not saying that's ineffective. It is still very, very effective to come from a place of pain and make a resolute decision. The problem only arises when you keep staying stuck in that pain and you keep reliving that pain and that trauma again and again. You let it haunt your life. That pain should only be used to make a firm, committed decision. And when you've made that decision, you focus on your decision. When people keep reliving their pain in their minds, that is the birth of suffering. Pain is very, very necessary. Suffering is not. Understand that we need to have a resolve to have and to act. Now, most people are very good when they have this resolve to go out and act. They say, I will do whatever is necessary. I will fight to earn a place under the sun. I will grind every single day and take massive action. That's great. 
More often than not though, this leads to you fighting against the flow of life. So right now, if you imagine life as a river or an ocean, it has a flow to it. Sometimes it wants to take you to a certain direction. Other times it wants to take you to another direction. Sometimes you don't like the stream that you're being taken to. Only then should you exert effort in changing the stream. But most of the time people are trying to swim upwards because they're impatient, they want the result now. So when we operate from a place of just pure acting and we want it now, this is a clear sign that we do not trust the divine, the powers that be to deliver us to our goals. So when we function from this pure place of acting, we're using our personal, our petty or our inner intention. Please understand this. This is crucial for you to understand. The resoluteness in your decision to act is inner intention. The resoluteness in your decision to have is outer intention. When you're not concerned at all with when it happens or how it happens, you only care about having it. That is you using outer intention. Outer intention is the intention that both belongs to us and does not belong to us at the same time. It's the worldly intention. It's the God intention, if you will. The greatest works of art, the pyramids, all the unexplainable, mysterious things that have happened, or even things in your life that were unexplainable. Most likely, it was the work of outer intention. It's when you were completely in alignment with the thing that you wanted and you completely surrendered to it. So I'm gonna show you by the end of this video how to get to that in the next part of this video. But for now, I want you to understand the difference between inner and outer intention because if you understand this, you'll be able to become aware of it in your daily life and as a result, apply it. Our goal is to transmute this desire into intention. How do we do that? The trigger point is when we make a resolute decision to have and to act. If you can simply say to yourself, Ah, it would be nice to have that. And if you can go from that to, I want that to, I will have that. I will do anything that's necessary. One way or another, I will have it. It is mine. It's already happened. I've made the decision and it's done. If you can get to that place within yourself, you will have it. The question becomes, how do we get there? Remember in the beginning of this video, we talked about the different doubts that we have, the different fears that we have. And I remember when I started off and I was able to quit my job and get to my first milestone, uh, which I'm going to share with you. Before I did that, there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of anxiety. There was a lot of limitations that I had. These were counter intentions. In order to tap into pure outer intention, our mission is to release all of the counter intentions, all the fears and all the doubts that we have. Okay. So in this next part of the video, I'm going to show you exactly how to do that make sure you stick around to the very end because this is going to be one of the most crucial things that you've seen. So let's get right to that. So now you understand the importance of releasing counter intention so that we can be purely aligned with our intention. So we can use the power of outer intention, activate it and have it work for us in our lives. I want to go back to Max Heindel and share another quote that he shares regarding this and the importance of this. The divine will is potent in proportion to the extent that the human will is made receptive to the influx of the divine. This is kind of important because it goes to show that this human vessel can channel divine will only when it is receptive to it. When the divine will and the personal will are in one line, they're in harmony, you're able to do better, you're able to do bigger. So have you ever noticed how the biggest companies in the world, their mission statement has always to do with helping people, with giving more, with being outward rather than taking. When your goals become aligned to the betterment of the universe and you can see how you achieving your goals benefits two or more people, you're actually slowly getting more and more attuned and aligned with the divine will. That's why a lot of people, like a lot of fathers that I speak to who become first time dads and they also happen to be business owners, they always say how they started to make more money when they had a kid because they had more reason to provide and to give. When we tap into the intention of giving, we're actually channeling divine will. We automatically change our state of consciousness from the lower levels to a higher and higher level when we focus on giving and opening ourselves up. Now, this doesn't mean you can't achieve your goals and you have to be Mother Teresa. You just have to conceive of how your goals 
can benefit at least two or more people around you. If your goal is to make more financial freedom, you have to conceive how it could help your family, it could help others, and how you could serve more people as a result of doing it. When I was looking at my goal of having a large YouTube channel, I was looking at how I could serve the world more and give more to other people and share valuable stuff in this video that could serve other people for free. And that's why I believe it worked for me. We need to learn how to channel this divine will by getting our personal will, our petty, smaller self that always wants to take, 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 to aligning it with giving. Because at the end of the day, you get what you give. Another way of saying this is we need to achieve an alignment in our heart and our minds, in the thoughts that we think and the feelings that we feel. Remember we talked about this earlier on in the video, that when you think about the goal, you may be able to think about it conceptually with your mind, but in your heart you feel pangs of doubt, fear and anxiety. That's the number one thing blocking you from getting to your goal. The key to getting pure congruence and alignment in divine and personal will is to release all counter intention. That is our goal here. And by the end of this, I'm gonna share with you a three-step method that is tried, tested, and true with over a thousand clients that we've worked with. But before I get to that, I wanna share with you more context of my story and a little bit about how I used it in my life so you understand how to better use it. When I got started off in this journey, before I started making YouTube videos, I was in college, my senior year in college, and I was doing a summer internship and I was supposed to go into a full-time engineering career. When I stepped into the factory that I was working in, a manufacturing plant, I went in and I looked at everyone and how miserable they looked. And they were all 30, 40 years older than me, close to retirement. And they were wanting to stick their arms in the machines to get workers comp. And someone actually did. And he got like a decent amount of money that he never had to work again. It was messed up. Okay, when I saw that, I was like, holy shit, I do not want my life to look like this. I do not want to be in this environment. What do I want instead? So from that deep place of pain, I made a decision. I looked at my life and I was like, you know what? To have everything that I wanted more, I just need 20K a month. I could live the life of my dreams on $20,000 a month. Then I set a goal. I remember writing down a piece of paper that by July 1st, 2019, I'll make 20K a month. Have my own business that does 20K a month. Mind you, back then I had no idea what business, I had no idea what to do, and so I was searching different opportunities, I was looking at trading, I was looking at drop shipping, everything. Nothing really resonated with me fully at the time. But then when I went through this whole process, I found out what it was, and I share all of it throughout the channel in my other videos. But the one key thing that was missing for me is when I got started off in this journey, I had massive resistance to the idea of even conceiving I could do 20K a month because I had a poor relationship with money and I thought the rich were evil and I thought I would never be able to make money because I wasn't business savvy, my dad wasn't a business owner, I, didn't, I wasn't raised by other successful business owners. I didn't think I could do it at all. And so every time I thought of the goal, I felt anxiety. The month that I was supposed to go full-time in my business when I was making YouTube videos, uh, and I promised my parents I'd be making 5K a month though, so they would be okay with me quitting that job, which I got a full-time offer for. Uh, that month I made zero. The month of May 2019, I made absolutely zero. And that's the month I had to confront all of my demons and I came across this method that was a big revelation for me. And so when I was feeling my lowest of lows, uh, going through a dark night of the soul in May of 2019, I performed this method and went through a deep period of reflection. June of 2019, the next month, I did my first ever 5K month in the business. July, I believe I did a eight or 12K month. This was a long time ago. And then August was my first ever 20K month, literally three months later. That goes to show the power of this method when you learn to release all of the counter intentions that you hold in your body at all times. These counter intentions arise from our old programming, the old way of thinking and being and how we've accustomed ourselves because it was so familiar. So I'm gonna show you how to do that, but understand that this is our goal. Every time you think of a goal, the thing that you want, how do you feel? What's the immediate feeling that arises? Is it a contraction or is it an expansion? If you feel contracted, if there's some sign of contraction, and by the way, sometimes it doesn't come up as soon as you think about the goal. Sometimes it comes up maybe a few hours or a few days after you think about the goal. There's that resistance. When it comes up though, that's a very, very good sign. That means you have something to work out. 
for most people, guess what? It's repressed. It's so unconscious that they can't even see it to be able to work on it. But when it arises, that's when we can work on it. And this doesn't mean you go searching for it. You simply think about your goal and you see what arises, okay? So now let's go to this method. I promise you this is going to be life-changing for you. The method is called letting go or the surrender method. And I read this from a book by David R. Hawkins. This is one of the most life-changing books I've ever read. I read it like at least twice a year and I've read it maybe over six times now. This is the number one method that every single client we share this with, they get immediate results with afterwards. This is how the method works. Number one, we spoke of this, you want to begin thinking about your goal. You may state an affirmation as it relates to the goal that you have. You may visualize the goal. You may simply just have a thought about the goal. So pick one goal, one main goal that you have. For me, it was that financial freedom. It was me operating my own business so that I, I never had to go into another nine to five or a job ever again. So pick a goal and observe what comes up. So chances are there will be some form of resistance because if there was no resistance, you would be living the goal right now. The fact that you're not living the goal right now means there is some form of resistance somewhere. So observe any sort of feeling. This could be just a slight feeling of closeness, a feeling of fatigue and tiredness, like, oh, I can't do it. Oh, that's too much work, whatever it may be. And when that feeling arises, accept it fully and watch. I know this seems overly simplistic. Believe me, I do. But the best solutions in life are usually the simplest ones. Go back to your goal, state it, watch it again and see what comes up and do this a few times. Repeat this cycle. And the third method is to ask for more of it. Ask for more of the resistance. What do I mean when I say ask for more of this resistance? When we feel some form of contraction, some form of resistance, most of the time what's happening is we think that having resistance is bad because our goal is to be free of resistance. If our goal is to be free of resistance, then we believe that having resistance is bad. But guess what? When you believe that having resistance is bad, you're pushing on your resistance. You're resisting the resistance itself. And what happens when you push back on something? It pushes back on you. That's Newton's third law, reaction force. When our resistances are really, really strong, the more we try to suppress them. In my life, back when I was going through this time and I had a lot of resistance, what I would do is I would try to run away from my resistances. I would try to replace my beliefs by doing an affirmation really quickly or meditating really quickly or doing some guided hypnosis really quickly. I would try to replace them instead of first accepting them and confronting them. Whatever you're going through in your life right now, have compassion for yourself. You're going through this for a reason. Something is coming up that needs to be dealt with. But what we do is we live through our worldly sensations and reactions of fight or flight. We usually, most of the time, fight against it, try to stuff it down, or we run away from it by escaping it in drugs, by escaping it in distractions. For me, what I was doing was binge eating. I would eat a lot of dessert, a lot of sugary foods every single night, and I would uh, watch TV and I would scroll through my uh, Instagram feed, my Facebook feed, I would just scroll like mindlessly, just trying to run away from that feeling. Because this was such a tumultuous time for me, there was just so much pressure because my parents every single day were hounding on me like, what are you doing? Like, are you making any money? Like, why did you decide to do this with your life? And I totally get it because they've grown up the mentally comfortable lifestyle where you don't take any risk and you sort of go for the safer option. Go to your nine to five, find a good job, be grateful that you're an employee. But I just didn't want that, right? And I'm sure a lot of you watching this don't want that. You don't want to settle for less. You want the absolute best, the creme de la creme of what life can offer. And that is available for you if you simply know how to optimize and use this human mechanism. If you simply have the courage to deal with all of the demons that are within you. This is how we do it. We simply ask for more of it. To turn off the resistance of the resistance, we simply open ourselves up to the resistance and let ourselves get flooded with the resistance. And in the moment, it feels horrible. But when it passes through you, 
you feel lighter and lighter. So when I did this in the month of May that I had absolute zero and I had felt like a complete failure, after a week or two weeks or so, I felt this sensation of lightness in the first couple of weeks of June. I just felt really, really light. And then the sales started pouring in, right? I didn't even expect it, right? The greatest things happen when you least expect it. And that's when I felt my absolute best and I felt so relieved of all burden. So this is the three-step method that if you keep applying into your life, and this might take weeks, even months, but if you diligently stick to just this one method of releasing all counter intention, you won't even have to focus on your goal or do some voodoo. The goal will happen. It will just happen at the right place at the right time. And intuitively, you'll notice more coincidences happening in your life. So now, I wanna share with you something really, really important that will actually help you with this. The other thing that I learned from David R. Hawkins is that in life, there are three paradigms of existence. There is the lowest level of all, which is the having paradigm, where the soul focus is what can I take? What can I take and what can I have? That's what the ego is focused on. A level above that, you're focused on doing. You're thinking about what can I do in order to have? What can I do? But at this level, you have a, a little more energy. At the having level, you're very devoid of energy. You're almost apathetic. You have very little energy and you just simply think about, oh, what can I have? What can I have? At doing, you're like, what can I do? What can I do? What can I, how can I stay active? But it's still not enough because you're still fighting. At doing, you're still battling. The highest paradigm of all is the being paradigm. When you become the right person, the right version of yourself, you become one with your goal. The doing, the actions that you take gets corrected. The right action simply flows through you as a result of alignment. When you become the ideal self, it becomes unnatural for you to take non-ideal actions. And when you become the right self, and when the right action follows, the right things also follow. When you start to view yourself as this kind of person, you will do this kind of thing, and you will subsequently have this kind of life. And in every single area of my life, this has proven to be true. When I became worthy of a 20K a month business, I became internally a 20K a month business owner, a 20K a month business happened for me. I made a comprehensive 40 minute long video for you on the art of identity shifting. When you learn to shift yourself at the very being level and you consciously do it, you're able to achieve the things that you want in your life with a lot more ease. So I made a completely free 40 minute long video for you. You can click right here to watch it right now. I urge you to go check it out, watch it right now, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.